Many thanks for the invitation to be with you here today. And I'm pleased to speak about really the formation of a translation profession in a particular society. And here I'll be drawing on the experience in Australia. I'm living and working in Australia, and I'm going to present that as a case study of, uh, of a more general problem that uh, I've been working on from various aspects. And I'm drawing here on some of the research I've been doing and some of the considerations that I've been made king in other respects. So here is the problem I want to build on, I want to work on, uh, how to build inclusive language provision services in a multilingual society. I'm living in a multilingual society right now. Uh, Melbourne, where I'm based at the moment, has about 250 languages being spoken at home. It is uh, a case of a super diverse city and services, social services are provided to this city in all the languages that are required. That at least is the aim. Note that I'm not talking about translation and interpreting directly, although obviously they are part of the solution or part of the answer to that question. Now, as a general question, the answer to that has to be, it depends. It depends on the society. It depends on the actual requirements uh, that, that are present. And so I want to argue here against um, a best practices approach, against the idea that, look, uh, it's been solved in Australia, so we can apply that in Korea, for example. No, I don't think we can think that way at all. We can only work here through case studies and then draw what lessons we can from what's happened in other places. The uh, groundwork or the, con the, the conceptualization of, of uh, professionalization uh, can be taken back to this model, which dates from Joseph Tseng's work in Taiwan and, uh, and has been uh, put into a more complex model by Zhu in 2009. Uh, it takes us from a situation of market disorder at the beginning here of the model, where people do not, do not really trust mediation. They don't trust translators and interpreters. Therefore, they will not pay a lot of money for them. Uh, and therefore, there is no incentive for professionalization. So this would be what you want to avoid, where there's no effective mediation because there's no real trust in the mediator. Uh, and in order to build up trust, you need signals of quality, signals of trustworthiness. And those signals can come from many, many uh, areas. I'll just walk you through this quite complex model of how you get from market disorder right down to uh, protection and licensure or professional autonomy. The, the ideal of translators and interpreters uh, requiring qualifications in order to work and not allowing other people into the profession. Uh, that was what was looked for there, uh, to become something like uh, one of the, uh, the liberal professions, like uh, lawyers and doctors, architects, for example. Okay. Now, just look at the complexity here. We have to get consensus and commitment. And a key link here is training institutions, which also come in again here, training institutions uh, interacting with a professional association, the development of a code of ethics, for example, lots of publicity to get everybody on board, political persuasion, which was recognized as being very important. Uh, the professional association and code of ethics then lead to certification. And here the training institution is coming again. Uh, that is legalized, you get a closed shop and uh, only qualified translators and interpreters can work, all right? And you've got uh, governments playing their role here. Now, now that is an interesting model or a roadmap of how one might want to uh, proceed. Uh, in the world, 
there is only one country where you have got or anybody has got to the end of this model that is where uh it's not possible for just anybody to set up shop as a translator or interpreter and that one country is slovakia and even there they find ways of getting around it so this is a very ideal model that effectively has not been realized in any country in the world i point out that training institutions appear three times here and uh, the aim is to establish a profession not necessarily to achieve social inclusion, which was what I had in my original uh, problem. Okay, so perhaps that is not the aim or not the best way of ensuring social inclusion. However, it's a model that we might like to be aware of. I know that model because I did something similar to it, or I led a team uh, that worked on the translation profession in the European Union. And we looked at status, at signals of status, signals of trustworthiness. And a lot of that research was ideally leading towards certification, to a, 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 a trans-European uh, certification of translators and perhaps eventually interpreters. Uh, that also failed, I hasten to add, okay? Um, my third model here is hot off the press. This was presented just a few weeks ago in Beijing at the uh, uh, Beijing Foreign Studies University. It, it is a model, uh, you've got the Chinese there, we've had it translated by Bei Hu over here. It's a model of a, a society's a translation capacity. And it gives us uh, a, a scorecard. You can see the percentages there of how to judge and quantify a, transla uh, a country's uh, translation capacity. And it's quite interesting in, in its percentages and, and, uh, and the intricacy of, of the view. There are first level indicators here, which you can see second level and third level. So I'll just look at the third level here where there are important things to bear in mind. Uh, the development of a capacity to deal with emergencies, for example, is something that we've been very uh, keenly aware of uh, lately. And it's great to see it there with a, a significant percentage. Legislation and policy is part of it. And then the translation industry is doing its part and uh, translator training is doing part of it with research actually playing a role here. Now, uh, the, uh, my Chinese colleagues have developed this model. They've put numbers in. I don't know how they got the numbers, but they get the numbers in and they figure out that China is number three in the world in uh, translation capacity. Uh, and therefore needs more work and more government involvement and investment in order to get to number one, uh, at which point the whole world will copy this model and Chinese culture will expand. Well, that's the idea. Uh, the model is neither good nor bad. I, I think any model is great if, for example, it draws attention to the existence of translators and interpreters. It gives a role and a purpose for research and training, which is what I do. And hopefully it attracts government investment. Okay, if that's the purpose, I'm sure that's going to work in China. It will attract government investment. Would that work in Australia? Probably not. Why not? What's missing in the model? If I look at this critically, what I don't find, but perhaps it's there, okay, but I don't find it in the higher level uh, categories, is civil society. For example, uh, what do associations do? The, the associations that we saw in the previous model, for example. Uh, what do all the community um, associations do that relay information to their members in their languages? What happens, for example, around me here in Melbourne, right where I'm living, I have about 10 churches around me. They all do translations. They all do 
uh, language classes in many of the languages uh, around us as well. So that whole uh, aspect of civil society is not there. And there is not an attention to the numbers of people in the society at large who, who can speak foreign languages and work as mediators. Uh, there's nothing here corresponding to the, the social value of mediation as it appears in, in the uh, common European uh, framework reference for, for languages, for language learning, the idea that in a particular society, so many people will have language competence in different languages and can work as mediators, okay? So that entire aspect is not there, it, nor is it uh, obvious in the, um, in the original model, uh, the, the earlier one that, that came out of Taipei. Now, why is there no best practice? Here is something I presented some years ago, and I was thinking about how we train translators and interpreters. And it occurs to me now as well that it depends where we are, at least on these axes. There can be more axes according to the particular problem to be solved. So uh, the uh, models I've seen want to situate things down here where only professionals translate, but we do have societies where everyone translates and, uh, and we have to figure out where we are on that vertical axis there. There are societies where a lot of information goes through translation uh, and, and we would situate ourselves right up there. There are other societies down here where not much happens in particular languages and we only need sp you know, sporadic work uh, for example, for many of the uh, African languages that we have here in, in Melbourne, it's not constant work. And the problem is precisely that we can't employ professionals on a permanent basis to deal with them. So uh, what I did with that from the perspective of training <clears throat> was to figure out how translation is integrated, not just in the work of translators and interpreters, but also in language learning. And I think that's uh, an area that, that uh, has to be added to the previous models uh, that I've presented here, at least if we're interested in inclusion, as opposed to uh, the area where there's only professionals translating. Uh, my work on that then took case studies and tried to put them on that, that map. And I can refer you back to that previous work. Here, we're interested in Australia, which, which wasn't in the previous map. I'm going to find a place for it here, okay? I, I now turn to the case of Australia. Now, uh, I'm working here uh, from a doctoral thesis done by Adolfo Gentile. It is very clear that the um, language service provision problem in Australia dates from the European ways of immigration in the 1950s. These are European languages uh, coming into Australia, uh, building up the country that we know uh, at present. And we can see some responses to that. For example, Australia was the first country in the world to have free telephone interpreting. The response though, um, or to the development of, of, of translation interpreting was responding to something quite different. Uh, this is Adolfo there, and his work uh, really pointed out the, the key role of this 1975 report on poverty in Australia, <clears throat> where it was found that one of the main causes of poverty were people not having the language resources needed to find out about the social services available to them. This is strange. We, we tend to think that Australia is a relatively rich country, and it is. Uh, however, the development of translation and interpreting as professions uh, responded to a problem of poverty. How did it respond? Well, in time, and you can see there quite quickly, in fact, uh, they set up what is now called the National Accreditation Authority for Translators and Interpreters, that is NATI, and that set up a code of ethics and a system of exams by which 
people in the community could be recognized as translators and interpreters employed by the government and made available to the various language communities. <clears throat> A decade later, we have the national language policy uh, getting through parliament. That was written by Joe Lobianco, another colleague over there. And the national language policy has two main axes. The first is English and the learning of English as a, a means of social cohesion. That's very clear. And the second one is social services may require language services. So whereas in Europe, we have a situation of language rights and uh, translations and interpreting has to be done uh, for the maintenance of language rights. In Australia, there are no language rights as such. Uh, there is a policy to provide services. Now, in that policy, it's very clear that a secondary aim <clears throat> is to develop and maintain multilingualism. That is all the 250 languages in Melbourne, uh, but also the indigenous languages are to be maintained as much as possible and recuperated in the case of indigenous languages. And that is indeed what's happening. So that's a very, very important difference. Language rights, certainly in Europe, Australia, social services. In Europe, we might have the profession in order to maintain rights. In Australia, the aim is an inclusive society and language uh, services as a part of reaching that particular aim. Now, when people set about doing that in the 1970s and into the 1980s, they looked around the world, said, who has worked on this kind of problem? And there were really no answers. So as you can see <clears throat> in this uh, quotation from Uldis Ozolins, who was one of the main players back then and is still the main player in this field in Australia, there was virtually nothing to draw on. And so people had to invent it, invented by uh, creating the, the accreditation authority, but also by looking for modes of training, which could take people who already know languages because they're in the language communities and uh, teach them the basics of, of ethical performance and assess and certify their uh, language skills. That's going back. So Australia's come a long way since then in those particular areas, in community translation and interpreting, that is provision of social services, and a lot of work done in legal as well in relations with the courts. And uh, what has typified the, the work done by, uh, I, uh, by Australians here, I, I was not in Australia, I was outside of the country for 38 years. I've come back, so I look around and see what Australians have been doing. Uh, I find that uh, the people I've named, along with Professor Sandra Hale here, have done incredible work um, with academics working alongside professionals in the accreditation authority and with members of the judiciary as well, collaborating to create knowledge and to create agreements about uh, how the profession is going to solve these problems. An important document is this one, which is um, just setting out the recommended standards for how to work with interpreters in courts and tribunals. Uh, that is to educate the professional interpreters, but also the members of the uh, legal profession about how to work with them. And that, that was so important that I've actually had that translated into Spanish so that we can do something similar in Spain. I, I also live in Spain. Uh, another example of that was done by uh, Professor Hale, uh, looking at the perennial question, in court, is it better to use simultaneous or consecutive? So you get members of the legal profession and you set up a big experiment with, with simulated hearings, one in consecutive, one in simultaneous, and you look at the effects that has on witness credibility. And I think these are wonderful examples of collaboration between different social sectors, uh, academics, professionals, and the, the uh, country institutions, judicial institutions in this case, working together to solve problems. 
Now, if we go back to this model of where Australians are, it, it's very, very hard because we have a situation where because of immigration, there are lots of people translating every day. So we're sort of up that end there, but there are so many languages that there are very few for which there's a high intensity information flow. Chinese has become the big exception here. But for most of the languages, we are up around in this quadrant here with low intensity information flows and, and a, an attempt to bring people from the top there down to here, that is to professionalize them in the sense of giving them signals of trustworthiness. How this works depends on the generation. So here I'm looking at uh, Jim Kravach's work on the Macedonian and Iraqi communities. Uh, so you get a particular language, a language community, and you see what's happened with the successive generations. Of, of, of immigrants. So here I'm, uh, I'm simplifying Jim's work a lot. Obviously, the first generation comes in and learns the host language. The uh, second generation comes in and the first generation members uh, become the interpreters and translators for the people coming in. So uh, when you get to the generation two, you've got those people within the community uh, operating as the mediators. And then you get to generation three and then four, uh, the problem is no longer mediation because the community itself is, is looking after that. The problem is the maintenance of the non-English language. You want to maintain diversity. And so the problem shifts to uh, making people proud of having their non-English language. And translation and interpreting services uh, do part of that work. Uh, they, they, they build up the prestige, the social recognition of the languages. They motivate people to learn those languages and uh, do what they can to uh, avoid language loss. And that becomes a, a second problem there uh, in the education systems as well. So the policy uh, shifts according to uh, the particular generations. Along the way, there was a great idea at one stage uh, that uh, because we have so many people who speak languages, these people can uh, work in industry to enhance uh, export, the export industry. Um, so you've got a report there done by Stella Valverde. That sort of didn't work uh, because the kinds of language that people speak in the home are not the kinds of languages, uh, technical languages or promotional material that you need to export your products. Uh, and so there's a, a basic social linguistic reality there that uh, one problem has been social inclusion. The other problem that is promoting exports has more or less been solved by working in English. So that connection didn't work. Don't try to copy that one, it didn't work in Australia. Here's a snapshot now of where we are. This is 2020, the NATI report, 179 languages. Uh, uh, people are accredited or certified as the, uh, the nomenclature now has it. Note, Melbourne has 250, a bit more, 252, 179. So not all the languages are covered, but it's a very big operation. <clears throat> 40 indigenous languages, <clears throat> 15,000 Practitioners, this is cumulative. I think since it began, it has uh, certified that many pr practitioners. It has uh, developed and a regularly updated code of ethics, which is obligatory uh, for practitioners. It's also obligatory for training institutions. NATI endorses 33 institutions. My university is one of them. So because we are part of that, I have to teach the NATI Code of Ethics. And uh, last year we were told that we had to give training in family violence situations because this is a problem that we have in Australia. I think that instruction is very good. Much, much as, as, as an academic, I would like to have freedom in what I teach with my students. I do in this case uh, recognize that the authority was doing well in telling us to give 
people training in that particular area. Um, is it a good model? I don't know. It's a company. It gets money from the exams. It's a non-profit company, but it does pretty well. And it's owned by the governments of Australia. That is a federal government and state governments. The problem here is that the governments are also the main employers of translators and interpreters. So in fact, the profession is being regulated by the employers. Uh, we also have a, 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 a main translators association, OSIT, and we have a union as well, which uh, pays more attention to how much translators get paid or not paid and work conditions. Uh, so this is obviously something that's done from the employer's perspective it may not be good for the development, financial development, social recognition even of translators and interpreters who have other uh, associations as well. I do not want to present the Australian case as a model. And uh, this past year or so of uh, COVID-19 has shown that it is not a model. Uh, for solving all the problems. You can see here that the press has been inundated with reports of inadequate translations, missing translations, bad translations, uh, not getting through to our migrant communities, particularly in Melbourne, which had a very long lockdown uh, last year. Uh, it got worse there were two cases when uh, printed materials and electronically available materials mixed languages. Uh, so we have cases of uh, Farsi uh, being mixed up with, with Arabic and um, Turkish being mixed up with Indonesian. Uh, so it's, it's a failure in the production of it's not bad translations, but bad project management. Uh, and just a lack of checking before these things went out. So uh, under pressure, under time pressure, some serious mistakes were made. And uh, this got picked up in the press and circulated through the press. And uh, people in Australia really began to lose trust in the quality of the translations. Trust is eroded, okay? And when that happens, we go back towards that situation of market disorder, which we had at the beginning. Now, one of the good things here, this was interesting because I, I was giving interviews on television, radio, and in the press, um, trying to say, no, translators are really well certified in Australia. They do not work badly. This is just a project management problem. <clears throat> to little avail, uh, the good thing was that the press outdoor was so huge that the government here in Victoria then gave uh, 14.3 million uh, for not just translation, but for mediation. And a lot of that money, so this is what I was arguing there, uh, a lot of that money then went not to translators and interpreters, some of it did, but to the many community organizations uh, that deal with particularly the elderly in these communities who are the people most at risk. So what we found was that the, the problem, the communication problem was being solved only partly by translation and interpreting, which gives you the official message translated into official language in many, many languages. Uh, in this case, 63, 64 in the case of Melbourne. But then the cultural communities uh, themselves will pick up those messages, do their own translations, but also their own explanations. To reach the elderly, they would phone them or print out information in the language and give them a printed bit of information because that's how people trust the elderly in some communities trust. If it's printed, it's real, I'll, I'll believe it, okay? So there were questions, not just of quality of translation, but means of communication. And so what we found here was the use of voluntary associations using mediation on a multi-platform, very wide sense in order to restore trust in the information. 
What's interesting, if you look around the world uh, at the economies of trust, you can measure in each society, there are measurements, how much trust uh, is in a government. In Australia, trust in government is pretty low, although it's gone up uh, through the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, so there is more trust in the community associations, in voluntary associations, which pick it up. And, and this is where I think uh, the aim of the inclusive society has been recognized and, and, and addressed. Not just by providing translations, that's not enough. People don't understand it uh, straight off. It's, it's technical information. The elderly are worried and panicking and, and, and are going to respond to somebody talking to them. And so I think as somebody who works on translation and interpreting, I think we have to recognize that there is more that can be done, that the reception of translation just doesn't have to be comprehension of a message. It should ideally be a conversation. So a lot of that money that was spent went into people going door to door and explaining things. And then people understand and can change their behavior. The problem we have here is that the professional ethics, the Nazi ethics, do not allow conversations, do not allow side conversations. The code of ethics is written for courts where it's understandable that the interpreter does not have a side conversation that only they understand. But in other situations for the provision of social services and here for, for behavior change, for dealing with, uh, with a pandemic, we need an entirely different kind of ethics that allows backward and forward flow. So uh, what we are finding here is a tension between the, the certified professionals and the people in the community associations who are doing a lot of the actual communicative work. Uh, this is from a conference that we had last year. And this was one of the people making a site, you know, in Zoom conferences, people send around messages. This is a, a an interpreter, a professional interpreter, community leaders sometimes are our main rivals. As they have lived in Australia for a long time and speak some English or better English, they resent when to be an interpreter, you need testing and certification. It's obvious also that the professional who has been tested and has certification resents the work of the community leaders. And I think here we have a problem of definition. And we have a problem of exclusivism. I want to finish with this. If there's one message I would take from the Australian case and present it not as best practices, but as a pro proposition that, that other people in other parts of the world might want to consider, it would be this. Translation and interpreting do not lead in themselves to an inclusive society. I think what we have to do as, as trainers and as researchers, as academics, and that's where I'm speaking from, is include translation and interpreting skills in all language learning so that those skills go into the stock of mediation capacity that is in civil society for whichever languages are needed. When I say that, I'm not inventing anything. It's been in the Common European Framework reference for a long, long time, which included mediation as the fifth language skill. All right, well, we, 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 we speak and we listen and, and we write uh, and we read and we mediate. And mediation there, in particular, interpreting or translating. So uh, the thing that's not being done enough for me and the thing that I think I really uh, want to urge my colleagues to work on is not so much the development of an exclusive profession that can be done, and it's a good thing to do for high-risk problems, for courts in particular, but also to pay a lot of attention to the role of translation and interpreting in general language learning. So we can build up a civil society of competent volunteer mediators. I thank you for your attention.